Centuries ago, a lone man stepped forward and began to speak in the midst of a crowded temple. A temple that was busy with people coming and going as they were presenting their offerings, their sacrifices at the, the festival. And, and a man stepped forward to speak, and everyone kind of stopped and started staring at him. Confused. Why was someone doing this? This is not what they expected. If you want to talk about God, if you want to listen about God, that's what you do back at your hometown, what we would now call a synagogue. But, but this was the temple. This is for the offering of, of sacrifices. The only sounds you hear there are the sounds of the priests doing their job and sacrificing animals. There's no sermons to be preached. And yet here was this weird man standing up and he begins to preach. And so Jeremiah stands up and he begins to give this temple sermon, what we now call a temple sermon. And what he starts saying, people are stopping to listen because they're shocked. And the shock starts to turn to anger, for he tells them, if you do not change your ways, you're not going to be able to continue to live here. And this temple is going to be destroyed. And the people hear this and this is a question. To, to talk about the temple being destroyed is just out of bounds. This is the temple. This is Solomon's temple built centuries ago. This is the temple that had saved the nation when Assyria had invaded the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah still stood because uh, they had the temple. That's how they understood what had happened. And so to talk about destroying Solomon's temple, God's temple, it, you don't talk about that. That's not funny. It's, it's not even something to, to mention. Jeremiah sees this reaction going across people's faces. Their mouths are tightening. They're all kind of tensing up. They're not pleased by this. And Jeremiah says, Do not trust in the deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. He is kind of mocking them at this point. He is comparing them to little children who stick their fingers in their ears and say, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, la 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 la. You ever have, have someone do that to you? This is what they're doing. This is the temple, this is the temple, this is the temple, this is the temple. They're just, we can't listen to this. This is not, you can't even talk about this. This, this is the temple. He's calling them spoiled little kids. It goes over well. But this is a problem. Jeremiah is saying that there is a problem. And specifically the problem is they are oppressing the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Now orphans and widows are exactly what they sound like. Aliens, uh, that term is sometimes translated as sojourner. What it really means is immigrants. Anyone who's not from around here, no matter how they got here, it means immigrants. And so, uh, Jeremiah is telling them that you are not taking care of the widows, the orphans, and the immigrants. And he is not bringing up anything new in doing so. He is pointing out something that Moses had taught the people back in the desert. In Deuteronomy, we read multiple times, uh, Moses teaches, Do not take advantage of a hired man who is poor or needy, whether he is a brother, Israelite, or an immigrant. Uh, do not deprive the immigrant or the orphan or take the cloak of the cloak of a widow as a pledge. God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the immigrant, giving him food and clothing. This is what God, uh, God says through Moses in the book of Deuteronomy multiple times. And then God sends the prophets to remind the people of this on a regular basis. The prophet Zechariah shows up and says, Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the immigrant, or the poor. Um, the prophet Ezekiel shows up at a different time and says, The people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and needy and mistreat the immigrant, denying them justice. And so this is a refrain that has been heard multiple times going back to the very beginning of the Jewish people as a people. Now you might wonder, why does God take the side of the widow, the immigrant, or the orphan? Well, it's not because they are perfect or sinless. It is because they are the most sinned against. We often have this, there's this interesting thing where we talk about poor or needy or immigrants or whatever being deserving. Eh, they're no more or less perfect than any, any of us. That is to say, we're all sinners. But they are the most sinned against because they had no one to speak up for them. In, in Jewish law, in Jewish culture, if there was a problem you could stand in front of the court or stand in front of your people who are trying to solve any disagreement and if you didn't have someone to, to corroborate what you said 
you, what you said didn't matter. It, you ha everything had to be proved by a second witness. If you didn't have two people, it didn't matter what you said. Right? You had to have a second person to back your play or else you had no standing. And who doesn't have a second person to back them up? A widow doesn't have the husband to back her up. The orphan doesn't have a parent to back them up. And the immigrant might not even speak the language. And if they do, they don't know anyone to back them up. And so the widow, the immigrant, and the orphan, they are the ones who are most at risk of being abused or ignored back in the day uh, of this, this day of Jewish society. They're the ones who need the most care because they're the ones who are most easily sinned against. And so this was part of being God's people from the very beginning. To be part of God's people is to be the people who take care of the ones who need the most help. This is the promise that God gives them. That the, if they do this, it will lead them to being able to inherit the promised land. And in as much as they continue to be part of God's covenant people, they will have this promised land. But if they cease to, to do as such, well, then that land might not be theirs forever. What this sermon is calling the people to do is to come back to this way of life, this covenant living, this covenant established between the Jewish people and God in the wilderness that begins with the Ten Commandments, which we hear echoed here. Jeremiah says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in the temple and say, We're delivered, we're safe, we're forgiven. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in my sight? Behold, I have seen what's going on, declares the Lord. But go now to my place, which was in Shiloh, and see what I did to it. So what happened at Shiloh? What happened at Shiloh is that that is the first place where the people worshipped God in the promised land. And after a time in which the people of God had strayed, this is right at the end of the book of Judges, which is the Wild West of the Bible. Things get really scary and weird in there. At the end of this time, the Ark of the Covenant is lost to the invading Philistines. The people are straying and Shiloh is burned. The, people, the place where people go to worship God has been burned because the people have strayed. And so God has done this before, destroyed the place where God, people gather to worship him. God can do it again. And the reason uh, God is considering doing it here with this temple is because the use of the temple has been perverted. It has been warped. It is no longer functioning as it was intended. You see, the temple had been intended to be this place where people in relationship to God continue to build that relationship. The people in covenant with God would show up and would build that relationship and they would shape how they lived. The logic of it being that we receive gifts from God and then you go to the temple to say thank you and to turn back to God and establishing that covenant and building that relationship, then you go forth shaped by that so that you reflect who God is. God is holy, we are called to be holy. And then you go out and as holy people, you live differently. So God gives us gifts, we go to the temple and say thank you, and sacrifice and thanksgiving, and then we go out to live as people who are different than the rest of the world. That's how the temple was supposed to work. But what had happened was the temple had been warped so that people would go to the temple and they were offering sacrifices to attempt to get their way. They had gone from a relational view of God to a sort of a mechanical view of God. If I show up and if I give God this sacrifice, then this is what God's going to do for me. If I do this, God, you've got to do that. If I offer you this many cows, you've got to make sure my crops come in. If I offer you this many doves, you've got to make sure my wife gets through this pregnancy. If, if I do this, you'll do that. And that doesn't change how you live, does it? That, that's trying to control God. That's trying to bribe God. And then you go do your own thing. When you have a problem, you go back to the temple. And you make another sacrifice to try to get your way again. That's what had been happening. And this sort of mechanical way of trying to manipulate God, God had had enough with. It had gone, the temple had gone from a place where people came to relate to God to a place where people went to control God or to attempt to. So God was done with it and had it destroyed. 
And now because you have done all these things, we continue to read, declares the Lord, I will cast you out of my sight if I, as I have cast out all your brothers, the nation of Israel. If you remember, the nation of Israel, the, the Israel had been split into a northern nation of ten tribes and a southern nation of two tribes, Israel and Judah. <clears throat> and Israel had been destroyed by invading Assyria, but now Judah is at risk. And God tells Jeremiah, don't pray for them. Their doom is coming. Don't pray for them. There are people who have their fingers in their ears. They're not listening. Don't pray for them because this message, as I understand it, is not for them. They're not going to be able to hear, but they can remember. And when their children ask what happened, they'll be able to say, Ah, the prophet Jeremiah told us why this was going to happen. And so these words are not for the people who were gathered at the temple that day. These words are given so that their children and grandchildren can understand what happened and so, and so and in doing so avoid walking down the same path. <clears throat> Jeremiah is thus not to pray for the nation and God gives an example of how far they have fallen. He points out that instead of families gathering to follow God together, to read Torah, to, which is described as being sweet as honey for those who, who read it. Instead the families are gathering so that the kids can get some sticks, dad builds a fire, and mom will make some cakes for the queen of heaven. A uh, God of fertility. And, and that's that is just become part of the family, how family, family fun day was making cakes for a false God. And so God has had enough of this. God speaks to the people of the temple, wrapping up this sermon by Jeremiah, and says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. I hope you hear this with a heavy dose of sarcasm. Because a burnt offering is meant to be what? burnt, right? Entirely burned up. And God is saying, you might as well pull it off and slice it up for some sandwiches because you might as well get some use out of it. Right? It's supposed to be burnt up. You might as well just eat the flesh because they're not, you're not doing any good giving it to me. I'm not going to be controlled by it. You might as well go ahead and have a meal off your sacrifices since it's not going to do what you intended. And now this covenant people, they had become so stiff-necked, they would not look this way or that, and they were headed for destruction. And the last words we hear are, You, Jeremiah, shall speak these words, but they will not listen. And you shall call to them, but they will not answer. Because these words are meant for their children. It's only after the fact that, we'll be able under, that people will be able to hear this and understand. So what do you make of a, a passage like this? It's one of the more challenging passages of the Bible. It's challenging because Jeremiah speaks to a specific place and time. He is speaking to a theocratic monarchy in the 6th century BC in a place with a monoculture of Jewish farmers having a shared faith, language, and lifestyle living in a nation that was smaller than most states that we have here in America today. Whereas we are living in a 21st century Western pluralistic democracy with a rapidly splintering culture that lacks a common faith. It would be easy to look at how different Jeremiah is from us and say, well, what, what do we do with this? How does this even begin to apply? I struggled with this question all week until I uh, sat down and, and noticed the obvious yesterday at about 1 o'clock that uh, the two primary concerns here that Jeremiah brings up on behalf of God are intensely personal. Do you have a right relationship with God? Or are you trying to manipulate him? And are you listening to those who otherwise don't have a voice? The widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. Those are the two things that Jeremiah is basing this on. The two greatest concerns of God is do you have a relationship with God or are you trying to manipulate God and make deals? And are you listening and speaking up for those who otherwise are not heard? You know, I can do those two things. And I think each of us can. First, to get into a right relationship with God that doesn't try to manipulate, doesn't try to make deals, that doesn't try to say to God, you know, I'll give you this, God, if you give me that. You know, if, you, uh, if you'll heal my, my family member, I'll go to church from now on. If, if I offer this, will you make sure my business does well? If I give you this, will you give me that? 
The point of being at church today is the same as the point of being at that temple back in the 6th century BC. We're not here so that we can manipulate God or make bargains with God. We are here so that we can learn to be in relationship with God, and for us that means to be in better relationship with Jesus to more closely follow in his footsteps. It is not church membership that saves us. It is a relationship with Jesus that does. Church happens to be the place where we get together to learn and follow Jesus. And so church is essential, but church in itself, this is not what's important. What's important is following Jesus. This happens to be the place where we do it. And so this is the place we gather to be in relationship with God as we pray and sing and listen and study and serve and then go forth as changed people. <clears throat> the second major concern God has here is to speak up those who are without voice. In that time, it is the widow, the orphan, and the immigrant. And some things don't change, right? Who does not have a voice in today's culture? That's not a rhetorical question. I mean, it's a challenging question. Who do we simply not hear from? Who, who, who we do hear from is pretty obvious. Educated white males. I'm one of them. Let's just get that out right now, right? I'm never going to be ignored. Educated white male. I got a lot going for me and I can't do a darn thing about it. That's just how I, that's who I am. But who do we not hear from? Do we hear from immigrants? Nope. We don't. Who else do we not hear from in our, in our culture, in our dialogue, a national dialogue, in our local dialogue? Who else does not have a say? People in poverty, right? They're not, they don't show up to vote because they can't get off work. They don't run for office. Half of Congress is millionaires. It doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat. The, number, the statistics are the same. Half of, half of Congress is millionaires and they write laws for a nation where half of Half of Congress is millionaires, and half of America could not come up with $400 right now to repair their car if they had to. All right, we don't hear from people in poverty. Who else do we not hear from? People in poverty, people who are immigrants, children, orphans, elderly, felons. You know who loses the right to vote? Felons. And you know what happens? We keep on saying, let's get tougher on crime. Let's get tougher on crime. Does anyone ever get to say, maybe we're tough enough? Maybe we can back off on that particular part. Who would know best? The people who have the least say, right? Felons. You do something stupid, you're going to pay for it, obviously. But uh, there are groups that we simply do not hear from. And God demands of us, and I don't use that word lightly, but it is the most common refrain among the prophets. God demands of us that we pay attention to those who are most likely to be sinned against because they're the ones without a voice. That is what Jeremiah reminds us of today. Those without a voice in our culture are the ones who we need to make most certain to listen to. Jeremiah's language about this is challenging and at times even a bit caustic and sarcastic. And it is not a joy to read Jeremiah. Yet we as a people who read of the catastrophe that he tells of, we are the ones who can learn and respond. We can first forsake attempting to control God, to make deals with God, and instead can commit ourselves or recommit ourselves to relationship with God, to following Jesus, to learning from God, to being, becoming closer to God in our day-by-day day lives. First, and second, we can commit ourselves to listening to and speaking vo for those who are otherwise just simply not heard. And in doing so, what we are doing is becoming part of God's work of redeeming the, the people that God loves most, us, his children. Amen.